Bhante, before I start, can you can I ask you can I ask you one one something? Okay. Uh, in Theravada Buddhism, how how uh, about this uh, uh, Bodhisattva the, the Mahayana? They talk a lot about this uh, Bodhisattva goal. How can we understand this uh, topic? Uh, which uh, what which are the condition? Which are the what, uh, and uh, something about this idea that somebody? That's uh, your question. Uh, does it take some time to explain to ask it? No, sure, sure. One day, one day, in some other moment, just to to share about this. I was but, thinking about you know, the Siddhartha Gautama and in the. In the uh, in the Theravada traditions, the Buddha only used the term bodhisattva in regards to himself in the, in the lifetimes before mm -hmm. he uh, became the Buddha. He talked to, to himself as when he was a bodhisattva, uh, a mm -hmm. being bound for enlightenment. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, in Mahayana, it's been more, uh, you know, uh, popularized and... Uh, now anybody can be a bodhisattva. So anyway, this is a matter of, <laughs> you know, opinion and, and so on. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead now and begin. So uh, with the Namotasa three times and the refuges for those who like to, uh, to chant that, uh, we'll uh, recite that. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangachami Dhammang Saranangachami Sangang Saranangachami Dutiampi Buddhang Saranangachami Rutiampi Rutiampi Sangam Saranangachami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranangachami Tatiampi Dhammang Saranangachami Tati ampi sangang saranangacham. Okay, friends, uh, welcome again to this uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, if you're here on the <laughs> East Coast, USA, uh, Sunday afternoon. And uh, <clears throat> so in the last few weeks, both in the uh, Sunday talks and in the uh, Wednesday night Sutta class, we've been talking uh, primarily about different aspects of the meditation practice, uh, you know, covering uh, the suttas like the Satipatthana Sutta, the Anapanasati Sutta, and then especially like the hindrances and the fetters that uh, you know block our ability to to stay focused and to uh, hinder the development of our meditation uh, practice. We talked about the ten fetters as being the underlying roots of the defilements, and the hindrances being the uh, sort of active. Uh, hindrances that arise can arise at any time during the day and in our meditation that uh, you know keep our mind in a very uh, narrow and confined space. Now uh, I want to go back and just uh, 
review some important aspects of understanding what meditation is because it's important to have that understanding. A lot of people could just come down, they sit down and say, oh, I'm going to meditate and they sit down and they, uh, without any type of preparation or so, they, they try to concentrate their mind. And then uh, probably for most of the time, they are in or out of drowsiness, wandering minds and, and uh, you know, distracted by the, the hindrances. So anyway, uh, to, to go back and uh, to review the, you know, the word meditation itself uh, comes from the root uh, M-E-D-I, the same root as medicine. So in the Dhamma practice, we see Dhamma, and especially the practice of meditation, as a, a medicine. So a medicine for the mind. And why is that? Because our mind is basically sick or it has a disease and that disease is ignorance and not understanding the truth about what uh, our mind is and how it works, especially. And uh, so, it, and being caught up, having been caught up in all of the, the web of comma and cause and effect with the senses, the mind being totally bound up with the six senses in, in a, you know, being affected uh, with attachment, aversion, and greed and hatred for the objects uh, that come through our senses and not understanding how all that has come up, people have become caught and tied in that. Uh, and and uh, coming to the, the fetters, you know, the, the deepest aspect of this ignorance, not understanding the truth, is not understanding how the ego had, has been uh, developed. That means the underlying basic ignorance is uh, being ignorant of what the ego is, what the ego consciousness is, what the idea of I, me, and mine, how, how that has become, uh, you know, entrenched in the mind, because virtually all forms of suffering uh, is connected with that. Uh, and we can see in the 10 hindrances, uh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, the 10 fetters, okay? So the 10 fetters we went over, the, you know, the, the first fetter is that of personality belief. So that's, you know, the, the, the feeling that this I and self-consciousness is something that's kind of real uh, and permanently there in the mind. Or that, you know, we are the owner of this body, we are the owner of our mind and we are the one that decides to do this or that, you know, the one that's hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching and thinking. And uh, I've, you know, uh, talked about how this has arisen in previous talks, that, you know, the idea that the baby's not born with eye consciousness, but it gradually uh, develops and also how the past and the future basically are created within uh, the mind. Now, so the, the very first hindrance is that of the personality belief. And the tenth hindrance, the last hindrance, is that of mana, which means the subtle uh, conceit. So subtle conceit is not a belief, it's an actual feeling that uh, somewhere in the mind, I am a person or I am uh, experiencing this, even if it's very subtle. Like you're sitting in meditation and the mind gets very quiet, but still there's that thought of, I am getting close to something, you know, I'm getting close to reaching jhana or you know, into the stream soon or whatever. So that's also a, a subtle pride. 
And uh, so from the first hindrance of personality belief to the last hindrance of uh, mana, uh, all of the other hindrances revolve around that. So there's I at the beginning and there's I at the end. But in the beginning, it's an intellectual uh, belief. And that is only overcome at the time of the entering the stream when one gets that full uh, clear glimpse of the transcendence of I, me, mind or ego consciousness. But it doesn't remove the, the feeling or sense of an I in the mind. But now you, you're convinced that this ego ultimately is an illusion. And it, it doesn't have any independent existence or we are not really the owner or controller of this body and mind. Although it seems like it, but we understand how it's been developed created and developed and strengthened through the course of our uh, lives. And also more importantly, that it, it's the deepest root of suffering, even though craving and aversion are on the obvious levels, uh, the reason for so much suffering in the world and the results of our karmic actions based upon uh, attachment and aversion to things that but it's the underlying ego that keeps the desire and aversion uh, going so from the the first experience entering the stream and then only at the stage of the arahant a full liberation is the subtle mana removed so from the very first fetter to the very last one it all revolves around uh, removing the food that feeds uh, the ego. That's how we have to try to see it. That's part of the basic understanding. Is ego is, is a food. It wants to eat food. So the four nutriments are material food. So, you know, everybody has desire to eat, right? We have that attachment to taste and, and so on. So there's actual desire for material food. And then there's the desire for contact. Contact is the second nutriment or food. And look at people are shut in now for uh, this coronavirus, right? And now they they're, they're, can't wait to get outside. You know, they wanna have more contacts. And so they're suffering from lack of contact. And so to make up for that, if they're not content to just sit by themselves, then, you know, they'll get a subscription to Netflix or Hulu or all these, uh, you know, things that uh, are available to watch constant 24 hour movies and programs uh, to uh, stimulate because they need that contact. And then the feelings that are produced by the contact. So the pleasant feelings, uh, even to remove your boredom. So boredom is a painful feeling. So we're sitting around, what to do? Okay, put on some old movies or, you know, new movies or whatever. And uh, you know, so you relieve that boredom. And that uh, gives a pleasant, uh, more of a pleasant feeling when you're engaged in doing something. And then the volition, we want to do something, just to do something. So you flip through the, the channels and you think you're in control. So, you know, we're always trying to believe that we're in control of our life. So I've decided to do this, and I've decided to do that. Look, I'm in control. But actually, that's not a control at all. That's being a slave to the hindrances, a slave to boredom, a slave to monotony, as, you know, uh, and all the habits that we've cultivated. So that volition is also a food uh, for the, to keep the process of karma uh, stronger, to make, to, to make the ego seem to be in control. 
and then the consciousness itself. You know, just enjoying the wanting to live, wanting to the consciousness that always wants to, to hear, see, taste, smell, touch, do things. <clears throat> it's that the ego to keep the, the sense of the ego uh, alive. So these are the, the four nutriments. And uh, you know, those are what uh, keep the ego strong. And so it's important as meditators to, to be mindful of how we are feeding this ego. Are we feeding it with more delusions? Are we feeding it with more uh, sensual uh, attachments? Are we feeding it with more getting irritated and angry at things? Uh, so, uh, you know, really the whole process of meditation is about removing the food for the ego consciousness. And that's not a negative thing. A lot of people may say, well, that's really negative. Wow, how, how can we live without an ego? Well, well, you can. You can live actually much, much better, more happily without it. Losing the sense of the ego doesn't mean you cease to exist. It means you cease to exist in this I-centered, always worrying about the me, worrying what other people think about me and all, all the worries and dissatisfactions get, you know, let go of when, when that sense of the I is gradually gets weakened little by uh, little. And basically we call that Mara, you know, in the, uh, in the Buddhist teaching, you've heard about Mara. So Mara, uh, in some of the texts, you, you know, the Buddha talks Mara is actually it's as that there was an actual person or some kind of a disembodied uh, spirit or uh, uh, being that uh, can affect us. But in the meditation psychology, we try to see Mara as basically the deep illusions within our mind in the small ego that doesn't want to give up what it's strongly attached to. So whenever we, we sort of try to take away the food of the ego, Mara, which is the ego itself, or it's, it's the unconscious delusions, the very deep rooted uh, uh, in the unconscious mind, uh, we, we threaten what the ego's existence by wanting to practice the spiritual path. And so the, the Mara will fight back. And so the, you know, most of the, the teachings, especially the teachings of in the Satipatthana Sutta and the teachings of also the Anapanasati, in developing both concentration and Mara, it is said to, we put a, a blindfold over Mara. That means we are shutting out its contact with the sensual pleasures. We're shutting out its contact with, uh, you know, fantasizing the future and uh, going back and pining for the past. And, you know, the whole gamut of our worries and poor me and woe with me and, and uh, all these things. We're putting uh, uh, like a or is said to be putting a, a blindfold over Mara. That means when you concentrate and you develop to the level of jhanas where your thoughts more or less subside, and you're no longer thinking about the past or the future and you're resting in the present moment on your, uh, you know, your subject of meditation, then uh, the mind is no longer going to the past or the future and uh, the hindrances have been subsided. So that's like, you know, temporarily you're putting a blindfold over Mara. And then when you practice the insight meditation and you, you tune into, by developing mindfulness, by developing the enlightenment factor of mindfulness or just the, the momentary concentration, uh, where you enter the, the flow of the present moment and the mind is just kind of floating from moment to moment with, with 
moments of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling, thinking, but the mind is no longer clinging on to any particular thing and it's just uh, kind of like a, a, a rubber ball kind of just floating up and down in the waves on the ocean, uh, just rolling with the waves, you know, the rising and the passing away of each wave. The, the mind is just floating with that, not getting sunk or pulled down uh, underneath, or not floating away from uh, uh, the top. So, like that. Uh, when you're entering the stream of the present moment, then also you're putting a Mara, you're putting a blindfold over Mara, uh, so to speak. So, these two practices, the Samatha and the Vipassana, or the calming and insight. So we call tranquility and insight. Those are one way that these terms, samatha and vipassana, uh, are translated. Uh, tranquility and insight. As opposed to concentration and wisdom, uh, actually I prefer, well, the, the, the term tranquility as opposed to concentration. Now, concentration is a means to gaining tranquility, but it's tranquility that we need to reach. So whatever method allows the mind to reach tranquility, that means when the five hindrances have subsided and the mind is resting in the present moment with the breathing, for example, or even just with, with the body, or with the moment-to-moment -moment awareness that's uh, not getting stuck on pull or pulled away to uh, the past or future or distractions, then uh, that is the tranquility. Of course, there's different levels of the tranquility. So, but it's that, uh, you know, the level of tranquility is, uh, you know, what we, what we need to uh, uh, sort of uh, reach mentally uh, for the, you know, the practice of meditation to really uh, deepen. So, you know, last week we talked about the Anapanasati Sutta, so some people might be able to reach that tranquility easier by practicing Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, and if they have the, the previous good conditions or the, uh, the right uh, maturity of their uh, spiritual faculties or previous practice, then uh, they might be able to attain tranquility or even the, the first uh, jhana without uh, too much uh, effort or having to spend too many, too long or, you know, years and years <laughs> practicing meditation to finally reach uh, these levels of tranquility and to maintain it. Or other people by reaching the level of, they might more easily be able to just uh, from the get go or without too much difficulty, just start having good mindfulness and being able to be mindful from moment to moment without the mind getting stuck and we become, mind, become mindful of the five hindrances, moment to moment, applying the proper uh, antidotes to release or to overcome the hindrance. And then the mind gradually reaches that moment to moment uh, awareness, which I sometimes call floating uh, awareness, but it's still one pointed, it means the one pointed means the mind is resting in the present uh, moment, whether it's the present moment on one object or it's the present moment of the flow of impermanence. As long as the mind isn't getting dragged to the past or the future or falling asleep, then basically it reaches that uh, uh, equilibrium and uh, equanimity that can easily watch things coming and going without being distracted. So, you know, that's really the ultimate purpose in the meditation is to, uh, you know, reach those uh, 
levels. And so the, in, in the practice of Vipassana meditation, you know, in order to overcome the hindrances, you have to be mindful of them. And you have to understand, as we've read before, in the five hindrances, that we have to know, you know, when this hindrance arise, we have to know why does this hindrance arise? And how does a hindrance keep on going? And how do we get the hindrance to cease? And then ultimately, how do we get the hindrance to cease in the future? The only way we get the hindrances to cease in the future is by removing the fetra, the fetra that is actually the underlying cause for the hindrances. So, you know, that's why the investigation uh, in, the, in the Satipatthana Sutta, after each of the sections of the body, feelings, mind states, and mental objects, we're contemplating the, the arising factor in, in the body, feeling, mind states, mental objects. And uh, the, the, you know, the ceasing factor, how do they cease temporarily and how do they cease uh, ultimately uh, altogether? And to keep them from arising in the future, that means the defilements. So that's part of the, you know, the, those three levels of wisdom, the intellectual level, then the reflective level, whereas much of our meditation practice occurs on the reflective level. So especially in, the, in cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness, the reflective level is the level that we're uh, primarily you know, using based on our previous intellectual understanding. We sit down, we start meditating, we start reflecting on uh, when the hindrances arise, the five aggregates and, uh, and so on. So that is how we, we trick Mara out of ourselves. So, you know, we've been brought up to believe that this body is real and it's mine and the world is real. And so, you know, Mara is the deepest level of unconscious ignorance. And uh, Mara is very clever. And in the ego trying to preserve itself, protect itself. So it takes a very strong medicine. So the, you know, the eight insight knowledges that we talked about last week, that is really the, the way that we sort of uh, trick Mara out of itself, or we trick the ego out of itself. Now the ego has tricked us into, uh, you know, believing it's real and to strengthening it and wanting to glorify it, strengthening it, using it to impress others or to or whatever, to, uh, you know, to, to get uh, famous and so on. So the ego has tricked us into the web of karma by saying, oh, get attached to this entrancing thing, or this thing is so beautiful, or these, these things are, you know, you know, no good. You don't, don't like them, or certain types of people or something. So we've been sort of tricked by society into a lot of beliefs that uh, keep our mind trapped. So it takes a very strong medicine. And so I like to, you know, kind of jokingly say that uh, the practice of the anicca sanya or developing insight into anicca dukkha natta is the way of uh, tricking the mind out of itself uh, by uh, contemplating the things that help to weaken the ego. And especially in the practice of vipassana, as I've mentioned in other talks, speeding up the rate of uh, perception. That, uh, you know, after the mind has gained tranquility, because this is what happens to uh, most people, many people when they meditate, especially the beginners, but when they reach that tranquility, it feels so nice and it almost feels like you're injected with a tranquilizer because you, you don't feel the pains or so much anymore. And 
you're just sitting there quite peacefully and there is awareness, you know, but it's kind of you know, magnetized and it's, uh, you know, it may be alert to, to certain things, but connected with your meditation object, but it's kind of gets disconnected from the other senses. And it's the other uh, senses uh, that really is where we practice the, you know, mindfulness of the mental objects and so on. And uh, also the sixfold sense sphere, which is one of the uh, important uh, objects of contemplation and the Dhammanupassana is contemplating the sixfold sense sphere. And, but anyway, speeding up the rate of perception, that means the momentary concentration that can notice more and more uh, sensory stimulations arising and vanishing through the, you know, the sixfold sense sphere. That means uh, the eye, the object, and the consciousness that come together with the moments of contact. But so anyway, uh, in speeding up the rate of perception, the mind enters the flow of the present moment. Uh, and it's not getting stuck on any particular sensory stimulation. So the past and the future, this is what's important, is the past and the future arises when we're paying attention unwisely to various sense objects because it then drags in the past about a certain object, even though it might be unconscious, and project into the future that we want that particular sensation or the feeling that comes with that uh, object. And, uh, and then the mind gets carried away with it by other types of various thoughts. So uh, when you speed up the rate of perception, and just noting each moment, letting it go, then the mind doesn't have time to bring in the past or future related to any particular object. Therefore, the sense of I starts to fade away. And this is what's important, really, really, really important to understand. Is that the ego exists in relationship to the amount of desire or aversion that it's experiencing with any particular uh, object. Or even if the mind is just resting in the neutral sensations and feels good, uh, it's still, the, the sense of I is still uh, there. So, uh, so if you don't have anything to, to pay attention to and you're just resting in that comfortable feeling, the, the sense of I am, you know, I've reached some good level is still there. It, uh, so it needs that, uh, uh, you know, in tuning into the flow of impermanence, uh, speeding up the rate of perception then uh, that sense of I starts to fade away. So that is, of course, the sense of I can fade away also in deep concentration, but it's a little bit more tricky because uh, it's too easy for the mind to get enamored or get uh, too complacent or content with just uh, feeling that PT and sukha sensations that are uh, there in that state of tranquility. That's why it's a, it's a slippery slope and the, that's why you have to, uh, you have to have a good awareness to, to not get stuck in that state of tranquility, but then uh, start contemplating, even if it's contemplating the, the nature of the tranquility itself. So, uh, <clears throat> and coming back to the 10 fetters, so as we learned uh, last week, you know, even when you attain the, the state of a, a stream enter, the, the mind could still have enough residual karmic formations or, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion for, you know, seven more lifetimes uh, in sansara. Uh, and so, <laughs> It, of, of, of weakening the other fetters. So at Sotapanna, you re reach, release 
overcome three fetters, but you still have seven left. And it takes, could take up to seven lifetimes to remove the rest of those uh, fetters. Although, as we know, it could also happen uh, much sooner than that. And, uh, you know, uh, at each level, more fetters are uh, being released, but it could take that long. So it shows you, this is to show you that the ego is, is so deeply ingrained that it's not easy to overcome. And that is why the Buddha devised this powerful method of uh, both shamatha and vipassana, but especially the vipassana meditation, because it's a direct, it's a direct attack, you know, like a, an attack dog. It, it directly attacks ignorance uh, at its root. Um, so, uh, and, you know, it took somebody, a genius such as the Buddha to have such a perfect understanding of the mind, and especially how the mind has become intertwined, intertwined and enmeshed in the web of, of comic, uh, you know, connections to devise this uh, system of, of meditation. You know, by cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness and the seven factors of enlightenment. I mean, not even the greatest uh, Western psychologist that we know of ever talked about the seven factors of enlightenment. I mean, you know. Uh, so, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have this kind of basic uh, background understanding. And that uh, comes to the point of the spiritual faculties. Now it's, it's really, you know, the Buddha talked about the five spiritual faculties. And uh, even that that's not directly one of the uh, factors of enlightenment and so on, but uh, most of them uh, are. are. Uh, but the first one is the faith. So that means having that uh, faith that this practice leads to a good effect. You know, and th this practice does lead the person who practices it to a wholesome benefits. Uh, and especially in terms of leads to mental uh, freedom. And you might just read about that intellectually, uh, but it, it uh, sort of, stimulates your desire to practice. You know, maybe you learn, knew nothing about it before. You know, all of a sudden you hear the teachings of the Dhamma, so you get some initial faith. That's what I call it, sort of excited faith. When you hear something for the first time and, ah, oh, there's some hope there, yeah, and thinking that if I do this, there'll be some benefit. Now, you know, there's three levels of faith. So that first level, that excited level, it gets you to start practicing. And maybe that level of, uh, of faith, you know, can get you up to the, uh, even to the level of stream entry where that faith becomes unshakable. But just because the faith is unshakable doesn't mean you have, uh, are, are gonna be free from the other fetters. But it's the faith that gives us the energy to practice. Uh, especially at that first level. So it gets us, gives us the energy to get up early in the morning, practice the meditation, do all the other uh, aspects of, of practice, developing, you know, practicing the Eightfold Path, developing, you know, Sila, Samadhi, and Metta, developing the mind in that way. Uh, so it takes a lot of effort in the beginning because of our old habits. Then even after attaining the stream entry, then, you know, a person could have uh, the, the uh, you know, a long period of time before they happen to get some deep experiences again. Uh, and so the level of enduring faith, at least that glimpse of the Dhamma, that faith, you'll never have doubts about it, but now you resolve that, okay, even though we have this faith, these other hindrances and fetters are still uh, strong. 
and you have to endure them. And we don't, and there's no telling when or how long uh, each person is going to take to reach the uh, succeeding levels. So that enduring faith that even when the mind is, you know, you know, feeling down or, you know, kind of getting complacent, you know, uh, it's still, it's, you know, something comes up and says, no, no, you got to keep practicing. So you endure the ups and downs that are, are part of the spiritual life until finally you reach, uh, you know, the level of become an arhat when actually uh, faith is no longer needed uh, because faith is a kind of a belief, but when you attain full liberation, it's no, no longer a matter of a belief, but it's a, it's a matter of, a, you know, full uh, uh, conviction. I mean, you know, experience. So, you know, like touching a hot stove, you no longer have to believe that a stove is hot because you, you've experienced uh, that. You might feel the heat from a stove, but until you actually put your finger on the stove and get burned and raise up a big blister or so, then you, you know. Um, so anyway, these are just some things I wanted to uh, review, but uh, just to, uh, I wanted to mention, you know, again, it, it's really the most important part is developing mindfulness of the five hindrances, because these are the things that prevent us from reaching the deeper meditation. And uh, they come up so uh, cleverly, you know, the hindrances, the mind gets easily uh, lost in them because our mindfulness is not, you know, sharp enough. So, you know, and this is what happens to people. Uh, you know, while they're sitting and meditating, they can have their mind maybe get, getting stuck on a few different hindrances. And it's just a matter of recognizing them and then having the skill to be able to uh, let go of them. So I'm just going to uh, leave you with this little analogy of the, the monkey trap that's there in the suttas about in the old days, hunters used to trap monkeys. So they used to get a coconut and make, with a knife, make a slit in the coconut, uh, just big enough that a monkey could put the flat hand like this, you know, into that slit. And then the hunter would put a piece of uh, food some smelly food in the coconut. So the monkey would come along and smell that. Ah, oh, what's that? What's that? And the, because of the greed, he stick his hand in there and close the fist. Then when the monkey tries to pull the, <laughs> the hand out, he can't get it out now because the fist is larger than the opening. And, but he won't let go. And he keeps on holding, holding until the hunter comes by later on and gets the monkey and then, you know, barbecues him for dinner. And, and so that's what happens to a lot of people that get lost in the hindrances. Uh, uh, you know, they spend the whole, half the whole meditation, uh, you know, uh, just being beset by the various hindrances that are, arise and uh, doesn't know how to let go of them. Or not, not just to let go, but to to create and use the antidotes uh, to try to overcome those hindrances so that the mind again is able to enter the flow of the present uh, moment. So, you know, during your meditations to, to notice that as soon as you notice that the mind is, you know, caught by the hindrance, then understand that this is sense desire, ill will, restlessness, worry, ego, sleepiness, and to uh, be able to let go of the clinging to that or apply the appropriate antidote and then experience the, the relief 
from that, coming back to the meditation object. So anyway, uh, uh, this is about all I'm going to, to uh, say about uh, this. Uh, you know, I just wanted to review these important aspects of the meditation. And, you know, each person's at a different level of the practice. And each time you meditate also, it's going to be different. And so, you know, the way that I generally uh, encourage people to meditate when you first come to sit down, uh, you could either, you know, start with a few stretches to kind of get the mind connected to the body. And then when you sit down, you know, if you've had a lot of upsetness or irritation, uh, you know, prior to that, you could send out metta or forgive anybody or that might have wronged you uh, or forgive yourself and send metta uh, for some time to help to relax and then come back to the breathing you know, maybe counting some the breaths from one to ten to get concentrated, and and then gradually, uh, depending, one could spend the whole. If the mind is, you know, has too many hindrances or, you know, not settled enough, just try to work more with maybe focus the attention at the tip of the nose, which is a the subtler sensation might help you to get a little bit more tranquil, but then not getting too attached to that and then at a certain point open back up to to the body and then uh, to notice the other you know sensations and tuning in to the uh, flow of impermanence okay so if anybody has any uh, questions about that if there's any uh, thing that you've written down on the chat box we can uh, have uh, some time to discuss some of those uh, so I'm gradually kind of cutting down the length of time on the Dhamma talk and want to spend more time with the meditation uh, uh, practice uh, as we go on. So uh, let's see if anybody has any. See, okay, one question is, would you please discuss the other four spiritual faculties other than faith? Can we use them as meditation objects? Well, there's faith, and then energy is the second one. The faith gives you the energy to practice. The faith that, okay, if I sit for 10 more minutes, I'll, I'll get some benefit, even if it's just enduring pain a little longer. Without that faith, that there's not going to be any benefit, even if you think there isn't, then uh, you're not going to give the effort to sit through that, that pain or that monkey mind. So uh, the f- the energy having that means the energy to practice the energy to to uh, develop all the the qualities that we've been talking about uh, and there's no way you can kind of really think about the energy it's uh, well to think about the death that you know now you have good energy when you're healthy when you're not too sick and when things are not too bad uh, you have the energy but when it, you know, we don't know when that could change. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you get sick or you, you know, if you had this COVID disease or any other, you know, you don't feel like meditating when you're sick. Or if there's other problems and worries you got to think about. Of course, now during this pandemic, <laughs> naturally there probably are more things you have to worry about, but you still, you'll have more time to practice also. So there's like two sides of a coin. Uh, so energy and then mindfulness. So the energy is to practice mindfulness. And you practice mindfulness to be alert for the hindrances, to let them go so that you can automatically gain concentration. So, or you practice them in in tandem. You practice the concentration by using the breath as a primary object, but then at the same time, noting things as they come and go in and around the the breathing awareness. So uh, faith, energy, mindfulness, and through being mindful of the hindrances, we suppress them, and then you gain that jhanic level of concentration or the momentary concentration. You gain the enlightenment factor of meditation then becomes established when you reach the level of the concentrated mind. And then through that comes the wisdom. Yeah. 
uh, the insights that you get, as we've already been discussing quite a lot. Okay, the insight into an each and dukkha. So those are the five spiritual faculties, and it's only a matter of practicing them over. And they're like stepping stones, one to the next. Uh, if you don't have faith, then you're going to get caught at some point, and uh, the effort that it takes to gain that mindfulness and concentration and wisdom, uh, you know, it, it'll be much uh, more difficult. So we, we can gain faith by reflecting on the life of the Buddha or reflecting on the life of the great disciples or other people that you, you, know, uh, you know, talked with or just in your own practice of meditation, you gradually gain that faith. And that gives you more and more energy. Uh, So yeah, the the uh, energy, mindfulness, concentration, those are the enlightenment factors. So in meditation, we, we understand. Is the enlightenment factor of mindfulness in me or not? Is the mind fully concentrated or not? Uh, does the mind have energy or not? So yes, there are objects of the meditation too, that's part of the uh, Dhamma Nupasana, five hindrances, and uh, the five, uh, excuse me, the, the five uh, the factors, that the enlightenment factors, those are three of the seven enlightenment factors. And you know how they arise and how, how they uh, get developed in, in the future, so you can contemplate them too. But it's not a matter of hoping that they come it's a matter of you know, doing the homework, you know, and uh, understanding how they get developed and then do what's needed. Could you review the antidotes to the hindrances? Uh, you know, that would take too, too long. I wouldn't get through any other questions. Uh, I suggest go back and read that pamphlet because that's really, that's the most power packed uh, literature on the five aggregates, I think, I mean, the five hindrances and how to overcome them that you'll ever find anywhere. So uh, go back <coughs> and, uh, and look up the, the links that I put on to uh, those. Uh, hopefully you can find them or maybe uh, Prashant can later sometime uh, put it back up, but that uh, link to that booklet by Venerable Yanaponika, the five hindrances and the conquest. Just Google it. Type into the Google, five hindrances in their conquest, and you should get it up. Uh, this question, when I'm working on a program or a problem, my mind constantly dwells on the same topic for a long time, sometimes a day or two, even while eating and doing other household chores, generally to the exclusion of other things. Is this a beneficial habit for concentration development or should I break this habit of the mind to be more mindful on the task at hand? Well, it depends on what that, that task or problem is. People just obsess about you know, various problems that they might have or it's the habit of the mind to run over it so many times. And it's also when we, we contemplate a certain problem. Okay, you might have a problem, you know, something to do. But when we're trying to figure out how to do it, our mind is also uh, having hindrances. So we can't fully concentrate on trying to figure out how to resolve this problem. Or our energy is to... to uh, you know, not e enough. So we, we can't maintain that focus on trying to resolve the problem. So we have to go over it so many times. It's like, you know, a, a student trying to study for an exam. Okay, they have to memorize a big list of things, right, for history or science class. Uh, <clears throat> but while they're trying to memorize, you know, they're thinking about their boyfriend, their girlfriend, or this or that, and or, or their mind, you know, nods out. And by the time they finish their 
reading the chapter, they haven't remembered much because their mind wasn't focused. So they have to go on re repeating it, reading it again and again and again for that information to stick. But if you do something, reflect on it, study it one time with the mind focused and concentrated, it will remember much better those things in it and you'll be able to remember them later without having to go back and uh, rehash them so many times over and over. So uh, it depends on what the subject is. Now, if you're thinking about the Dhamma, that's a good thing. But if you're thinking about stuff that just keeps your mind in more worry, anxiety, greed, and aversion, then those are not uh, beneficial habits. But the habit of contemplating the Dhamma pondering it. Actually, there was guidelines that Buddha said when you study Dhamma, first you have to, you know, come and hear some teaching. But then you have to re re remember that teaching in your mind. And then you have to uh, ponder on it and reflect on it over and over again until you, uh, you get that aha moment. Ah, yes, I understood that. You know, it, it sinks deeper. Uh, so that's how we have to, uh, you know, uh, by, you know, while you're doing things during the day, you know, uh, even, you know, while you're eating, you know, just practice mindfulness of eating. Or when you're, when you're out working, you practice mindfulness of working. You know, being aware of if negative thoughts in your mind. Why am I doing this? You know. They, somebody else should do this, whatever. So many uh, negative thoughts can come into the mind uh, based on the ego. And so use that to reflect on. And if you're thinking about that, that will be a useful type of uh, thinking and reflection. Uh, developing the, the yoniso manisikara or wise attention, not the unwise attention. The unwise attention leads to more confusion, more uh, attachments and aversions, where wise attention leads to more clarity and less attachments and aversions. That should always be the guideline. This question is self and mana the same? Well, in short, uh, yes, the sense of I, but mana is a conceit. Although in many of the texts you see, mana is the, the conceit I am. So just the thought of I am, whether I am better than somebody, or I am not better than somebody, or I am equal to somebody, that is kind of a measuring. And actually, it's very interesting. The word mana, Pali word, means to measure. And so even man comes from the three first uh, letters of, of mana, M-A-N. So man is a person, that their mind has evolved to the point that they can measure. That means you can look on both sides and it can you know, develop this kind of a measurement, measuring myself against somebody else, or my work against somebody else's work. So that's mana. I am better than the other people meditating. You know, you're sitting meditating, you want to open the eyes and you see the teacher nodding out. Ah, oh, look, I'm better than the teacher <laughs> or, you know, somebody else. So, uh, but the, the, the self is just the, the general, it's kind of the belief in the self, but mana is, Specifically, that, that kind of conceit, the measuring mind, whereas the self is just a general sense of that I exist. So that you know they're kind of one and the same, but they might have you know have some different you know connotations. Okay, I see. Uh, Prashant has put up that uh, link to the overcoming of the hindrances. So try to remember that. 
Okay, friends. So that uh, looks like the end of the questions. Those are good questions, but um, so now we're going to go on to the most probably the most important part, or let's say you know after having developed the intellectual understanding to immediately go in and reflect on what you might have been reading or hearing. That's why normally I don't like to give Dhamma talks up and not meditate afterward, because that's the way it works. Intellectual wisdom, then you have to immediately reflect on that while it's still fresh in your mind. When something comes up, oh, hindrance of pain, or what is this hindrance? You have something to immediately draw on rather than just, oh, this, oh, oh, and the mind get dragged away. No, you have to have this uh, immediate on-call ability to uh, replace a yoniso manisikara with yoniso manisikara, or wrong reflection with the right reflection. That means reflecting on the dumb. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a few minutes break to use the restroom or drink of water, and then we're going to do a few uh, exercises as before, and then uh, have our period of, of meditation. Okay?
Okay, we'll uh, start the yoga now. Let us stand straight, relax your shoulders and arms at the sides, feel the feet pressing the floor, or mentally feel the height and the weight of the body over the feet. Then begin some deep, slow breathing drawing the air from the lower lungs up to the top, holding the air in the lungs for a few seconds, and returning to this, <clears throat> and relaxing on the out breath. We combine these movements with that same deep breathing. Just letting go of your thoughts the whole time, just keep the mind focused and feeling the body, the sensations generated by each of the movements. On the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch the lower spine a little, and stretch upwards at the same time. On the out breath, turn the palms downwards and touch the top of the head on the out breath. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, head back, arch the lower spine, stretch. Feel the sensations. Out breath, touch the top of the head. Once again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms. Hold it a little longer. Feel the sensations. Release the fingers on the out breath, arms back to the sides. Relax. Just keep feeling the body, especially in the hands and fingers to feel the increased pulsations, vibrations. Just mentally remember standing, standing, the present moment of the body. A few where the clothing touches the skin of the body in different places. Okay, next on the in breath, you want to push up on your toes, raising the arms over the head. And just face the palms toward each other about six inches apart and stretch or touch the ceiling. In the out breath, come back down, arms to the side, heels to the floor. And next in breath, up, use the breath to help lift the body. Out breath. Once more in.
Relax. Start feeling the body, the increased sensations, vibrations. Four element vibrations, hardness, fluidity, temperature, motion. I just remember standing, standing. Feeling where the clothing touches the skin of the body. It's also the earth vibration. And next we'll do side bending using both arms. On an in-breath, raise both arms up and keep the fingers and the arms straight close to your head. On the out-breath, bend over the right side as far as you comfortably can. Try to keep the arms and hands parallel to each other. In-breath, lift up. And pause. On the out-breath, the other side, out-breath. Feel that stretch in the side. In breath up. Again to the right, out breath. In. Out. Once more to each side, out, and the out breath, lower both arms. Relax. Feeling all those body vibration sensations. The aggregate of form, and the physical sensations in the body. Four elemental vibrations. One last exercise, the head turning. On the in-breath, turn the head to the right as far as you comfortably can. Pause. The out-breath, turning 180 degrees back to the left, to look over the left shoulder. Pause. Next in breath back to the right. Out breath left. In 
in breath, right? Out breath, left. On the in-breath, let the head stop in the middle, relax, and feel the whole body standing, standing. You know, go ahead and sit back down. <clears throat> I'm going to again turn off the video so that you're not tempted to open your eyes or want to watch me meditate. Keep your eyes closed to watch yourself meditating. Again, just try to sit straight, the back straight and the head aligned, the spine, First of all, just you know, feel the weight of the body pressing the seat. Feel the pressure, solid sensation of your buttocks and feet pressing the floor. Just understand that's the earth vibration, the feeling of solidness or hardness. And feel your hands and fingers touching. So each hand touches the other one or whether it touch the legs, it's also the earth vibration. And relax the shoulders. Feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders, where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders or arms or chest. It's also the earth vibration. Now feel the head balanced on top of the neck. Try to keep the chin lifted up so it's level or parallel with the floor. And feel your face. Feel the different sensations on your face. The skin stretched over the skull. where your lips are touching together. Feel the nose. Feel the eyes and the sockets.
Now from that point behind the eyes, just try to let the awareness kind of open back up and feel the outline of the sitting body. Or if you have difficulty doing that, or you just want to focus on the air going in and out of the nose, you can focus at the tip of the nose. But I would recommend just trying to feel the larger body and then begin some deep, slow breathing to feel the expanding and contracting movements of the abdomen, rib cage, your chest. Feel the air moving through the nostrils. And after breathing in, hold the air in for a few seconds to feel that pause, the present moment pause. And feel the long outgoing, contracting out breath. Try to take several deep, slow breaths like that to oxygenate the blood, to maintain a straight posture. Just thinking along these lines to yourself. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. If you want to combine this with a brief metta radiation, you can, as you're breathing in, breathing in, thinking, may I be myself and all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Breathing out, may all beings be well, happy, and peaceful, free from greed, hatred, and delusion. And we're going to try counting the breaths from one to ten to gain a more precise concentration. So if you want to concentrate where the air moves, touches and moves through the nostrils, you can do that or just feel, continue to feel the expanding, contracting sensations. So on the next in breath, mentally count one. The outgoing breath, also one. Next in breath, two. Out breath to in breath three out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five.
out breath fine. In breath six. Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. Now discontinue the counting, discontinue any deep breathing. Just let the re breath return to its uncontrolled rhythm, but stay focused. either at the tip of the nose or on the feeling of the, in the center of the body. Or you can hold that feeling of the outline of the posture in the mind's eyes. Just continue to observe the shorter breath. I did notice the beginning, the middle, and the end of the in breathing and the pause. The beginning, the middle, and the end of the out breathing and the pause. The brief pauses between the breaths. Just feel, remember that the body is sitting. If you can, just feel that outline of the posture. Just breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Just adding the sitting posture to the breathing awareness. Just breathing in, sit. Breathing out, sitting, 
developing a mindfulness and concentration. Feel subtler sensations connected with the breathing process. At the same time, being alert for any hindrances arising, especially your drowsiness or the wandering mind. Apply the appropriate antidote or reflection. The hindrance will drop away. Stay more grounded in the present moment. In the breathing body. Feeling the whole body breathing in. Feeling the whole body breathing out. Especially on the out breathing, or to feel the outgoing breath, the last bit of breath going out of the body. Feel that, feel that moment of stillness before the next in breath. Be alert for thoughts when you sneak up into the mind. Just observe them kind of coming and going in the back of the awareness. We're keeping the breathing or the body in the front of the awareness.
even while the breath is continuing with one in-breath, there's actually many, several different sensations of the in-breath can be noticed. Different sensations connected with the in-breath. different subtle sensations connected with the out breath. Notice how the in breath arises and vanishes, comes and goes. How the out breath arises and vanishes, begins and ends. Pay attention to that beginning and end of each breath, of each in breath and each out breath. If you pay careful attention, you might notice that there's an intention to breathe in just before actual breath coming in, sort of like a desire to breathe in. So the breath comes in. And also a desire for the out breath to start. We notice the intention to breathe in, the intention to breathe out. Then you're directly observing the mind, the mental formation of volition. can't notice the intention in the mind, mindfulness is not sharp enough. Get sharpened through the concentration. Notice how each breath is different. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes an easy breath, sometimes a difficult breath.
while you're developing your concentration, you might feel a pleasant sensation arising. Feel the body tranquility. Just notice that pleasant sensation, feeling. How does this pleasant feeling arise? Because of developing concentration. How does it cease when the hindrances invade the mind again? Be alert for any unpleasant or painful feelings that begin to arise, to pull the mind. See that desire, any desire to move or intention to move. Even as directly observing the, the volition. And urges me. sounds are heard, be aware it's just the hearing of sounds arising, vanishing in the background. From time to time, take a few deep, slow breaths. Help keep the mind grounded in the body. The present moment awareness. If the mind is relaxed enough, just Gradually open the field of awareness. Try to notice more sensations arising and vanishing in or through the body. Or if there's any thoughts connected with those other sensations, it's just thoughts.
or if you have a lot of thinking, wandering thoughts, you can just think about the Dhamma, just think about the five aggregates. It's not thinking, it's feeling them. It's breathing bodies, the aggregate of sensations, material sensations. Breathing sensation, solid sensation, the heat, air movement sensation. These in turn are producing feelings, pleasant, painful, or neutral feelings. If you can notice some painful or pleasant sensation, if there's thoughts about the feelings, those are perceptions. That's my hand, or foot, or head. It's a mental perception. Even the idea of breathing as a mental perception based on sensation. If there's any urges to do anything, other thoughts, that's volitional formation. The sankara, even the hindrances of sankara. Then consciousness, that sense of I that's meditating. Sort of thinking or identifying the aggregates might be a form of thinking, but it's directed thinking, it's positive thinking, thinking about the Dhamma. Why is attention? This is form, this is feeling, this is perception, volition. Consciousness, constantly changing, arising because of contact. It's happening all by itself. This is the mindfulness factor of investigation.
any time the mind gets too confused or if it's drowsing off, come back and take some deep, slow breaths to reground in the, to the body. Come back to the present moment, awareness. Just breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Readjusting the posture if it was slouching. You can just sort of observe or just mentally watch this body sitting and breathing. This interaction of the five aggregates. Establishing that awareness that this five aggregate body and mind exists, but just for the purpose of gaining concentration, mindfulness, and insight. Not becoming entangled in the outer world, greed, hatred, and delusion. work out one's karmic responsibilities without getting further and deeper entangled.
Sambhi Sankara Anicchati Yadapanyaya Pasati Adhani Bindati Dukhi Esa Maggo Visu All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They arise only to pass away. When one sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to freedom. Okay, now let's spend the last few minutes of the meditation and sending out thoughts of metta, friendliness, best wishes to ourselves and all other beings. So he invited to straighten up the body and begin some deep, slow breathing and after breathing in a deep breath, hold the air in the lungs for as long as you comfortably can to try to feel the subtle surge of oxygenated blood going out to all the cells and tissues of the body, being like metta to your own cells. And on the out breath, feel that relaxing contraction of the out breath. Just thinking along these lines as you take a few more deep, slow breaths. May I be well, peaceful, wise. On the out breath, may all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. Breathing in, may I be free from the pains and sufferings of body and mind. On the out breath, thinking may all beings be free from pains and sufferings of body and mind, brought about by their own unskillful thought, speech, and action. Breathing in, may I have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom. And breathing out, may all beings cultivate strength, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Breathing in, thinking may all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together. Breathing out, may all beings be well, peaceful and wise. Before ending the meditation, just make this kind of mental aspiration. And I'd be able to continue to develop the spiritual faculties of faith, mindfulness, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. I'd be able to share that with other beings as I'm able to. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise.
I'm putting up on the shared screen this little chant for those who like to chant this kind of brief version of the metta and also the English meaning after the chanting of it. Dukkha pata cha ni dukkha Bhaya pata cha ni bhaya Sokha pata cha ni sokha Hon tu sabbe pipani no Dukkha pata cha ni dukkha Bhaya pata cha nibhaya Sokha pata cha nisokha Hon tu sabbe pipani no Dukkha pata cha nidukkha Bhaya pata Ta chani bhaya Sokha pata chani sokha Hon tu sabbe pipani no May the suffering be free from suffering May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. So too may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. And thus spoke the Buddha. And again, for those who like, we'll finish by chanting the word sadhu three times slowly on the out breath. Sadhu. Sadhu. Now take one more deep in breath and as you breathe in, stretch your head back, try to arch your lower spine, hold it a few moments. And lift the head up and on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. On the in-breath, lift the chin up level to the... On the out-breath, relax, feel the whole body. Okay, friends. So, uh, the, uh, Prashant, I tried to get the... English meaning of that chant, that Dukkha Patta chant is in English, but my screen wouldn't roll it up. You know, got any reasons for that? We have to try, we have to try it sometime again, you know, if we can find it out. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay, friends, so uh, I'm glad you could all join uh, today. And uh, again, try to keep your meditation practice uh, going and especially you know work on being mindful of the hindrances and applying the proper antidotes so that you'll be able to uh, gradually you know attain the level of good concentration be able to sustain it for longer periods of time doesn't mean just gaining some concentration for a few brief moments or so but to be able to maintain that level of, you know uh, momentary concentration or excess concentration to be able to uh, begin that uh, 
you know, inside uh, development. 